So let me just, uh, to fix ideas, have you think back when you were in high school or elementary school or middle school to your favorite teacher? Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. Okay, this is my favorite teacher of all time. That's Sandy Krapinski, my high school chemistry teacher. Okay, I think she's a great teacher. Okay, and there are many, many people who I think would have agreed with me. She won a bunch of teaching awards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But can I prove it? Can you prove that your favorite teacher was really a great teacher? Was she great for all the kids in the class? Was she just, were you just the teacher's pet? And she or he liked you? How do we actually measure effective teaching? Because we all, I think, agree that it matters, and I'll show you some evidence trying to put some numbers around how much good teaching matters. But I think people instinctually think, oh, teachers were very important to me. They really helped me along the road. But how do we actually put some quantitative rigor around this big, important question that not only influences individual lives, but also influences the state of economic growth for uh, nations across the world, as shown by many, many uh, research studies. So you know, what is good teaching? So it's a really long-standing question. This is not a new thing that people have been concerned about. The view that teachers are important uh, is, you know, it goes back uh, probably way past this one, but this is a great quote from the New York State Commissioner in 1932, which basically says, look, if we want to improve the schools, we have to think about who is teaching, right? Can we get our uh, uh, great teachers? Now, the problem is measuring teacher performance is very thorny not only from the research side, but also from the policy side. So let me just go through a few of the things that make this such a complicated exercise, okay? The first is teaching is a very complicated job. We're not making widgets. I'm not on an assembly line, right? I'm not installing windshields. I'm teaching. And that involves lots of different activities, okay? It's a very complex exercise, all right? And it has multiple goals. What is it that I want my fifth grade teacher to do? Do I just want them to teach math? Do I want them just to focus on reading? Do I want to make sure that they ha you know, show my kids how to behave well, how to become good citizens, how to not fight with each other, right? It's a complicated job with multiple goals, all right? We have lots of heterogeneity in what I'll call inputs. The teacher is standing there in front of a group of students, or hopefully actually circulating among a group of students, not just standing in front of them the whole time, all right? But those students are all heterogeneous. They all have come from different backgrounds, and classrooms will be different. So how am I supposed to know if a teacher is doing a good job if a lot of what uh, the process depends on is the inputs that come from the students, or that come from the parents? or that come from the textbooks they're using, or any of the other myriad inputs that go into the exercise of education. We think the teacher is crucial, but because they're surrounded by a whole bunch of other things, how do we isolate the teacher's part? Okay, that's difficult. Infrequent outcome measurement. You might have just one test at the end of the year that you can observe as a researcher or a, as a policymaker. Teachers might have you know, home-baked quizzes that they give out every week, but as a uh, superintendent of a major public school district or the commissioner of a state department of education or as an outside researcher trying to figure this out, you don't have access to lots and lots of data points the way you would with uh, another type of organization that has quantitative output on a more regular basis. And then the last, which is I think very important when we think about the public sector, and let's face it, in most countries education is dominated by the public sector, you know, we have a whole other set of issues that you might think cause there to be inefficiencies, cause there to be obstacles in how teacher management is done, how, what you're allowed to measure, what you're allowed to do in terms of personnel management. But there's all these other obstacles that crop up when we think about policy. So there have basically been two major approaches to thinking about quality in teaching. The first, the traditional one, is to think about the qualifications of the teacher. Does this teacher have a master's degree in education? What are their credentials? Where do they go to school? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's kind of a bit passe now, but for many, many decades that was the norm. The second is a classroom observation. That's how we measure good teaching. We go into the classroom, somebody sits in the back of the room, they watch me teach, and they say, okay, they, they did a good job. And this is basically a meaningless process, okay? It's very perfunctory, it's very meaningless. It's usually just, you're okay, or 
you're not okay. And in most school districts, 99.9% .9 of the teachers get the box that says you're doing just fine. There is a movement to change that now, okay? Across many states, they're trying to get to these sort of teacher evaluation 2.0, which actually, you know, we think of as a more rigorous, meaningful process, but for the most part, it hasn't been. And the more innovative one, which I'm gonna talk about, which is where I'm kind of embedded in this research agenda, is using outcomes, right? That it's not about who you are or what I can see you do, it's about results, right? Who is producing results? Who is producing outcomes for kids? That's what good teaching is. That's what effective teaching is, okay? Measurement of student growth. Now, that is not an easy thing either, okay? So if we really cared about student learning, why not measure it directly? That's kind of an easy thing. So, oh yeah, sure, let's measure it directly. Let's just measure it. Not so easy, right? It's not like a firm, you can say, who's the more successful firm? Well, the one that made more money, boom, we're done. Who's the more successful teacher is a hard question to ask, right? This measurement problem is a very difficult, thorny, issue, okay? So let me just give you a quick flavor of why that is. Here are two classrooms, okay? This is Mrs. Smith's classroom, Mrs. Jones' classroom. Oh, you have the pointer here, right? Okay, and here's the bar for whether their kids pass the exam, okay? And I'm just giving you some examples of students A, B, C, D, et cetera, okay? Which one did a better job? Who's a better teacher? In the blue bars, we have the prior performance of the kids. In the red bars, we have the current performance of the kids. Who did a better job? You might say Mrs. Smith, okay, because her kids gained more on the e exam from last year to this year. Mrs. Jones' kids didn't gain as much, but most of the regulation we had recently said, eh, it's Mrs. Jones' kids that are doing fine because they passed the exam. They're doing fine, not Mrs. Smith's kids, okay? That's sort of the premise of no child but left behind. But let me make your lives a little bit more complicated. That's kind of an easy one. We can say, oh, but that's not fair because Mrs. Smith's kids started out behind, it's about what she's doing with them, not about where they ended up, because they might have started up uh, way ahead in the race. Let me make your life more complicated. Which of these teachers is more effective? Mrs. Smith's average growth was 47 points, let's say. Mrs. Jones' average growth, 50 points. Not only are they ahead at the end of the year, but they actually grew more. Who's a better teacher? Is it now Mrs. Jones? Well, how do I know? How easy it is, is it to take a kid who started out way behind their classmates and bring them up? Is it just as easy to raise these kids' scores by 47 points on some state exam as it is to raise these kids' scores by 47 points on a state exam? Who is easier to teach to? Low achieving or high achieving kids? How do I know that the psychometricians who created this state test have it so that every single point on this test is exactly equal to one another in sort of the quantity of learning. I don't buy it, okay? I'm skeptical of this. And that's why this is a very, very difficult issue to get around empirically, okay? So, that's that, so we're coming at this from saying, look, how am I supposed to figure out who is a better teacher here? Can I get my ha a handle on a metric that I have confidence in, okay? So, Value-added analysis is a set of uh, tools, I'd say, okay, or it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a technique for trying to get a better answer to this difficult question, okay? The idea is we want to compare the actual performance of the kid to some benchmark, right? We want to know, okay, this kid scored a 562 on the state exam. Is that good? How am I supposed to know? What's the right benchmark to compare this kid to, right? Would I have expected him to get a 520 with an average teacher, therefore he blew the exam out of the water, or would I have expected a 600 out of this kid, so he actually underperformed? So what we're gonna do is, right, that's the big challenge, we're gonna basically use big data. We're gonna use lots and lots of data points, particularly when you have a large data set with many classrooms and many kids, you can start getting a very tight comparison group for every single student. We can take a student with a certain set of characteristics, a certain test score performance history, and we can match that kid up with many other students that look exactly like them, and also match a classroom, a set of peers, an environment, to other classrooms that look like that, in terms of the percentage of students that come from poor families, that have learning disabilities, all of those environmental factors that you might think play 
Okay, so we're basically going to run a big regression now, right? So you know, this, there's a lot of fancy econometrics to go into this, but you should just think about this as a big regression where I'm going to ask, did somebody outperform or underperform relative to other kids in a really big population that look like them? And that's basically it, right? It's not super fancy. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth. A lot of research has been done on you know, exactly how to do this right, but in the end, it's not that complicated, okay? The question is, does it work? So I'm going to show you some evidence on, on that. But some basic results that come out of this are if you do this kind of value-added analysis, you find substantial variation in this value-added metric across teachers. And it's, it's sort of, it's meaningful in this following sense. Take the difference in the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile of teachers on this metric. That's about a fifth of the black-white test score gap, which is a very persistent and pernicious and large gap in the United States. You about get a fifth of it gone in one year if you get the difference between a 25th percentile and a 75th percentile teacher. Okay? In interestingly, much of the variation is within schools. It's not that all teachers in school A are bad and all teachers in school B are good. There's actually a big mix, right? I had Ms. Kropinski, the fantastic chemistry teacher, but science teacher down the hall, nobody really wanted her. Okay? And many, many schools, I think, have this characteristic. The, the other thing is that the value add estimates, they're stable enough to be useful. Okay? And what do I mean by that? I'm going to show you with a different example. They have year-to-year -year reliability about 0.3 to 0.5. What does that mean? Let me just put that in a different context for you. This is uh, the 10 baseball players with the highest batting average in 1998. Now, I, I'm dating myself. I usually give talks to like school administrators that are in their 40s and 50s. They know these names. So only if you were watching baseball in your early childhood would you know them. But OK, Bernie Williams, Mo Vaughn, these are really great baseball players. And in 1998, all of them hit well above 300, which means more than 30, well more than 30% of the time they were able to get a hit. Okay, great hitters, right? These are all superstar hitters. But if you look at their batting averages in 1997 and 1999, it turns out that half of them batted below 200, below 300, excuse me, right? Which is kind of a benchmark for great hitter, right? Hitting above 300. Half of them did worse than 300, even though they were incredible in 1998. Batting average stability is about on par with these value added metrics. Okay, so that gives you a sense that these things are useful, they give you some signal, they give you some information, but of course, they're like any kind of performance statistics, sales numbers or any kind of more, uh, quantitative measure of performance. It's not always going to be the same year after year. Another way to think about the stability, this comes from a, a paper from some colleagues of mine who looked at LA data, but you, you could use, do the same thing with lots of different data sets. What they did was they took two years of performance data, okay, and they put each teacher into a quartile bottom, second, third, top quartile. And then they said, how do these people do in the third year? Okay? If the information was meaningless, the third, these curves would be lying right on top of one another, but they're not. So the bottom quartile teachers are here with a solid line. They're clearly underperforming all the other quartiles on average, and the difference between the top and bottom quartiles are very large. So this is about 10 percentile point ranks for every single kid in the class. It's a very big deal. But what else you'll notice is, look, there are a small number of people who started out with very poor performance, who in the third year, they did OK. And there's a small number of people with very great performance in the first two years, who in the third year don't do so well. Now, this could be because these teachers were unlucky in years one and two, and this is how good they really are. Or it could be they really stink, and their third year, they kind of got lucky. Okay? But there are very persistent differences. And if I told you that you have a choice of where to send your child or where to be educated, Next year, one teacher had two years of bottom quartile performance, one year teacher had two years of top quartile performance, the odds are you're going to be better off with the top quartile teacher. Okay? But I want to, like I said, I want to all hands above the table here. You know, these are not perfectly persistent measures. They're not any quantitative measure of performance is always going to have this uh, stochastic nature to it. All right. So let me give you, uh, let me fast forward to more recent work. A lot of papers have focused on these teacher impacts on student test scores. I should say, why are we using student test scores? It's because it's a nice standardized measure you can use to compare across kids in different classrooms. I can't use the quiz or the final exam because how am I supposed to compare classroom A to classroom B? They might have given very different assessments. Okay? And of course, they keep just grading their own assessments. So. 
Raising test scores is the goal, right? I don't care necessarily about a math standardized test score in and of itself. I care about what it represents, which is human capital, which is learning, which is some set of skills you're going to be able to take out into the world and use to do something useful, OK? So this is my original paper, which is now 10 years old. Uh, and then you know, fast forward to about two years ago, I got together with two colleagues. This one is Raj Shetty. He won a MacArthur Genius Grant. So now I've, not, I've worked with a genius. You can say that he really is a genius, so they don't give those awards out for nothing. Okay? And these guys are linked up with the Department of Treasury. They're Harvard economists, but they have this link to the Department of Treasury. And what we were able to do is link together data sets from, from a school district, a large metropolitan school district, whose name remains anonymous. <coughs> but it's one that I got the data for. You can guess who that is. Um, able to link these data, these kinds of data, with tax records for the children as they grew and went all through their late, uh, up until about their late 20s. That's about as far as we can observe them. We can observe them more and more and more as time goes on. So we're able to put together what I call the chocolate and the peanut butter. You know those Reese's peanut butter cup commercials, right? These two things go together. And then we can ask, do these high value added teachers actually impact student outcomes later on in life? Because that's what we really care about in the end, right? We don't just care about test scores. And in fact, people are very concerned that, hey, you might be good at raising test scores, but that's because you just test prep the kid, right? You give them the answers to the test, or you teach to the test. And some other teachers are involved in more deep learning that really helps you in the long run, and they don't care about bu bubbling in the right answer because they're focused on, they got their eyes on the prize. Okay? So we want to ask, are these kinds of test score based metrics, do they actually signal something about a the quality of teaching that is long lasting, that is helpful in the long run. Okay? In addition to that, we do some other econometric things. So I've linked, this, uh, uh, linked up two papers that come out of this research. The, the first one is purely st statistical. Okay? It's trying to convince you that these measures are kind of causal measures of who raises the test scores the most. Okay? And we have a, a, a new, uh, two new pieces of evidence on that that I'm not going to talk about very much. And the second paper is about the long term. Okay? But the two tests are, First, we can show using these tax data that once I've controlled for things like your testing history and your other characteristics and the characteristics of your classmates, whether your parents have higher income or they own their own home or they have 401k savings or all these other things that I can see that we can see in the tax data, none of that stuff matters in my model. Right? You don't have to put that in the model. Everything's already kind of controlled for, which is really important. And the second is we can run these kind of little experiments where we say, well, let's take a teacher and te watch them move from one setting to another, from one school to another or one grade level to another. If they were looking good because somehow they got to get the best kids always, like the, the principal always gave them the easy to teach kids and that what makes them look good, makes them look like they're raising test scores a lot, when really it's just they get the easy to teach kids somehow, then when they move to a new grade level, they might cream skim there as well. But what is that going to do? It's going to make them look good but it's going to make their other grade level teachers look bad. And on average, kids in that grade aren't going to do any better. right? They're just shuffling kids from one classroom to the next. But what we show is when a high value added teacher moves into a classroom, uh, sorry, a, a, a new grade level or a new school, the average test scores of all the kids in the grade level go up by exactly the amount we'd expect based on that teacher's impact on their own kids. OK? I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job explaining it, but it's all in the paper. I encourage you to go read it. Anyway, so some new evidence. This, though, is the smoking gun. So once you believe that these value-added measures are at least interesting to look at, we're just going to graph. We just split the data up into 20 quantiles. okay? And we just said, what's the average earnings of the kids who got these teachers? And we see a very clear upward relationship. okay? So you go from the average teacher, we sort of normalize them at zero. This is uh, one standard deviation above the mean. And you get an increase in annual earnings at age 28 of about, I think it's like $200, $150, $200. Does that sound like a small number or a big number? $150 a year, having a much better teacher. Doesn't sound like all that much when you say it that way. But what you have to think is that's one year, one kid age 28. So what we do then is we say, OK, well, let's take this number, and let's take the data on lifetime earnings trajectories, OK? 
and let's add it up across a lifetime for a classroom full of kids. Because the teacher doesn't just teach one-on-one, -on -one, they teach to 28 kids, and they're raising 28 kids' earnings by an average of $150 or $200 every year. Actually, it's more than $200 if you think about it as uh, proportional housing. All right, so that's what we do. What's the number we get at the end? $266,000 per classroom per year. So a teacher, a great teacher, could be doing this is for a top 5% teacher, right? a really truly outstanding teacher. They're getting over a quarter of a million dollars of extra value compared to the average teacher year on year on year on year. And they are not making $250,000 a year as teachers, I can assure you of that. Okay, so huge, huge value being created by these high impact teachers. And in addition to the stuff on earnings, we can see impacts on college attendance. We see reductions in teenage births among women. We see people live in nicer neighborhoods as measured by kind of a whole bunch of socio-demographic characteristics. Uh, they save more for retirement. All the things we can observe in, in taxes, okay? So let me just, uh, how am I doing on time? Pretty good, right? Uh, wrap up with a couple implications for management policies, okay? First, teacher performance is crucial. Sure, a great teacher might get you into a good college. They might get you to graduate high school. But later on, do they really matter? You might have fond memories of Mrs. Jones, but did she really impact your life? Or is that just some fuzzy, you know, warm imagination, you know, dream that you have? We really show, hey, actually, it does matter. It does matter on a whole bunch of outcomes that we can see, all right? And the second is, what do you want to do with this data? Now here's where the rubber meets the road, okay? What I would say is these kinds of value-added metrics, they are an extremely useful tool, but they are incomplete. They're an incomplete measure of teacher performance. They're just one slice, and we know that any quantitative performance metric is gonna be limited by the quality of the data, and we only have a limited slice of data. We have a, an end of year set of exams, Okay, but that's just you know a couple of days of testing at the end of the year. What about everything that happened during that year? How are we going to account for all of those other things that a teacher might do if we can't observe all of them? Okay, so it's an incomplete measure. And what that means is that if you're going to get a fuller picture about what teachers do, you need to think about other complementary performance measures that can be linked with value added to create an overall picture of the job that a teacher is doing. Right? Not only because of the stability issues that we've talked about, but also because raising your academic performance may just be one dimension. We haven't talked about a whole bunch of sort of non-cognitive or social ability kind of things that great teachers might do. Okay? And there's some evidence coming out that if you think about teachers' impacts on academic outcomes, and you can also measure teachers' impacts on non-academic outcomes, those two are positively correlated, but not perfectly. That is, there could be some teachers that are really great at teaching you chemistry, but they don't really teach you how to be a great citizen. And there are other teachers who can teach you how to be a great citizen or a great person or a nice you know, student. And those things will also be valuable later down the road, even though if they don't, aren't that helpful at making you pass the AP chemistry exam. Okay? And we need to capture all those dimensions of performance, and we have to do it with other tools that we have at our disposal. So, more reliable evaluations are gonna have to incorporate multiple measures, okay, including things like classroom observations, movement towards using student opinion, mixed, mixed feelings among teachers about how much they want their students evaluated in them. Okay, but the chances are, once you pull these multiple measures, what's great about that is it increases your confidence level in the decisions you can make after that. You can make a decision as a manager of a school or a school system based on multiple pieces of data. If they're all pointing in the right direction, you can have much greater confidence level that you're making the right decisions about hiring and firing and uh, retention. Okay, so I will leave it there.